Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. We are absolutely blessed and, and super grateful for uh, Dr. Sabine Hamill to join us, who's a paediatric rehabilitation physician at the Monash Children's Hospital with a ton of experience. And she's gonna talk a bit about um, adolescence and ch child chronic fatigue syndrome, also known as ME. Um, so I am, without further ado, gonna hand it over to Sabine. Um, and if there's any questions as we go along, please just type them in, I'll be monitoring them um, and we can bring them in and we have some towards the end, but we love, love, love questions. Yeah, um, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to talk today, Nathan, about a topic that I'm really passionate about. Um, so chronic fatigue syndrome and what I was hoping to cover today was diagnosis, key features, what can be the mimickers and what is the impact on adolescents and the young people that I see? And then importantly, management. What are management strategies that we try and use? And in terms of diagnosis, the frustrating thing is we really are still not sure why some people get chronic fatigue and some people do not. We don't have a specific blood test or diagnostic tool to diagnose it. Symptoms can overlap with loads of other conditions. So how do we actually diagnose this condition? So the key things are really a thorough history and examination and importantly excluding other things that we know can mimic it and then using a symptom profile because we there is now very strong understanding and a consensus that there is a definite symptom profile that can help us make the diagnosis. So what are those key features and there are a number of different formal criteria over the years. You've probably heard things like the CDC for CUDA criteria in 1994, more recently um, international, um, the IOM the, in the USA. Um, so they're in lots of international consensus criteria and all of those really bring together, there are these key features that we see again and again in people that present with chronic fatigue syndrome and that make it different to just standard ordinary tiredness. And with the fatigue, it's persistent. It's day in, day out. It doesn't respond to rest. It impacts on function. And in adults, the strict criteria say at least present for six months. In young people, we accept um, three months to be able to make the diagnosis. So um, the criteria are slightly different in young people. And then another key feature is this entity of post-exertional malaise and unrefreshing sleep. Now, with this entity of post-exertional malaise, it's really felt to be quite key. And it's that issue where you can push yourself, you can go out for that run or you can go out to that party, but then you really have significant payback and then you can be quite unwell for a number of days afterwards. So worsening of symptoms after physical, mental or emotional exertion. And we really see that as a key feature. Then other key features in particular are cognitive impairment and or postural, uh, postural symptoms. And I'll go through those in a moment. But with the cognitive impairment, there are problems with thinking and memory and attention, information processing, executive function, executive function is your organising skills. And again, those can all be worsened by exertion, effort, prolonged upright posture, stress and time pressure. So it has a big impact on school and education for young people. And then orthostatic intolerance. Um, and many of you might may have heard the term Postural, uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which also is amongst that umbrella term. And with that, you can get lightheadedness when you get up out of bed or when you get up from a sitting position. You can feel dizzy. Your symptoms are worse if you have to stand for a long period of time or stand in queue. And you have increase in your fatigue and your memory symptoms when these issues come on. And you can get headaches and nausea as well as part of this. So, so those are the sort of key features. So with that thorough history, we also then want to go through and check, are there any mimickers? Are there any other medical conditions that cause fatigue and cause some of these symptoms um, that we could actually diagnose and treat? 
And the key mimickers that we're going to be looking for are thyroid function problems, anemia, celiac disease, which often can have alongside of issues with fatigue, inflammatory bowel disease. So that's separate to irritable bowel syndrome, which can really overlap with chronic fatigue. Um, obstructive sleep apnea, where you have difficulty getting restful sleep because of airway obstruction. A rare condition called narcolepsy, which is more linked to sleepiness rather than fatigue and autoimmune conditions. So they're the sort of key things that we'll be looking for and potentially doing some baseline blood tests for. So it is really important that you access your general practitioner or your specialist to work through those things and don't just rely on Dr. Google. And Dr. Google can be pretty scary. And if you do look up conditions and you think, oh my goodness, my symptoms do mimic this or do look like this, Take that to your GP or your specialist and work through that. Don't sweat it at home or um, you know, worry about it. Really take that to your doctor to work through. So those were the sort of issues around diagnosis. Now I was going to move on to impact, in particular impact for young people that I see and that I work with. So there are biological symptoms. So symptoms, impact on physical functioning, but there are psychological consequences as well. So consequences for mental health, social consequences for friendship, effects of isolation, and as I alluded to before, impact on education and your learning, and then impact on family life. And I really, I really like this um, picture that I came across that, really tried to pull all this together, looking at all the symptoms that people are troubled with. And some of the ones that I, I didn't mention, we recognise that there are a constellation of other symptoms that people grapple with, including muscle pain, joint pain, headaches, sore throats, light sensitivity, so it's difficult to be in crowded places, nausea. So all of these things people are grappling with and living with, and they're not being believed, they can't see their friends as much, they're struggling with school, um, they're not able to participate in family life as much as usual and that can cause conflict. So there's this really huge impact. And adolescence is a time where you're really wanting to connect with peers and you're needing to connect with peers. And chronic fatigue often gets in the way of this. So there are some key adolescent milestones that you're trying to work through and achieve and chronic fatigue can potentially get in the way. So moving on to management, keeping all this in mind, how do we manage this condition? We've diagnosed it with excluded mimickers. We're certain this is now chronic fatigue that we're dealing with. We've looked at all those potential consequences and impacts. How do we deal with this? And a really key principle is that it has to be holistic. And our overarching aim has to really be that chronic fatigue doesn't get in the way of where that young person wants to go in life and what's really important to them. So in thinking about management aims, I really feel there are three key aims. Firstly, you want to maintain function and minimise symptoms. You want to minimise the deconditioning. You want to maintain sleep-wake cycle, diet, avoid boom-bust patterns of activity. Really kind of maintain things as best as possible. Then you also want to prevent and manage the secondary consequences. So you want to avoid social isolation, disconnection from peers, halting that education pathway, secondary anxiety and lowered mood. And Thirdly, you want to enable that young person to achieve their goals. So a key feature in all the young people I see are these feedback loops that can really get them stuck, get in the way of where they want to go, make their symptoms worse. And one of the key feedback loops is this deconditioning loop, decreased activity, you know, more bed rest, more time sitting, more time lying, more time on the couch. So physically you decondition. So then when you do try and do something, you feel worse. So you decrease your activity further. And so this cycle continues. Um, and
and it's really important to get help in this area with experts such as an exercise physiologist or such as a physio that can prevent this and help you work through this. And then stress feedback loops. And I see this in the mo most of the young people that I work with. They're stressed about their symptoms. They're worried about missing school. They're stressed about not seeing their mates, being out of the loop. So their anxiety levels rise. Their adrenal hormones rise. Their energy is used up through that anxiety and that stress. And there's further increased frustration and stress. And so the loop goes around and that little bit of energy that they had is gone. So in this area, it's really important to have tools to help manage stress and potentially work with a psychologist who can help you. And then the social disconnection feedback loop. You can't see your friends. You're out of the social loop. When you do go back, you feel awkward. You feel like you're on another planet. They're talking about things that you haven't really um, been part of. You feel really out of it. You avoid contact. And then it's even harder to reconnect. So it's really important to make yourself stay connected, even in a small way. And I think some of the forums um, that Nathan's team are facilitating are fantastic in this respect uh, because you can have peers that understand what's happening to you that you can also connect with. So what have I learned from the young people that I work with? What have they been telling me? Firstly, I think they really need to be believed and heard. It's such an invisible illness and so often they're encountering people who don't believe them or think they're faking it or think they're goofing off, slacking. So that need to be heard is really critical. They really need advocacy in helping navigate that education and career pathway. As an adolescent, you're trying to become independent, but if you've got something like chronic fatigue that can get in the way of that and that can get in the way of the energy you need to advocate for yourself. So having some people that can help you with that, um, be that an education consultant, a teacher that you get along well with at school that you can connect with, um, someone who gets what's going on for you that can help you navigate that pathway. And management really needs to be individualised. One size certainly doesn't fit all in this condition. And everyone has different goals and everyone has different baselines that they're starting from. So really individualising things is critical. And that need to stay connected, as I've mentioned before. And what are parents, what about, what are parents telling me when, when I see them? And it's a really big challenge for parents because they don't know how hard they should push or not push the young person that they're wanting to support. Should they be forcing them to get up out of bed? Should they be forcing them to do this or that? Or should they just completely back off? So there can often be this sort of tension and push-pull um, and that's really challenging. And they don't want to be therapists, they want to be parents. So that's really challenging as well. And so enlisting the help of people that can support that process so that parents don't have to do that work can be really important. And parents worry a lot about the young, their, their young people. It's, it's a really stressful thing for families. So getting some support in that area is important. So self-management. So the, the reason why with the young people we work with the adolescents we work with, we focus very much on self-management is it achieves quite a number of goals. It supports that young person to be heard because it's about them and their goals and also they have to do the work. No one can do the work for them. So it also does encourage them to take ownership and it takes away that push-pull between parents and the young people and between teachers and the young people. Um, it enables us also to work in partnership. So what are the key messages in the sessions that I'll have when I'm meeting young people and their families with chronic fatigue? And I think initially we have to get all the basics right. So it can sound a bit boring and a bit repetitive, but all the basics are really important because if your sleep cycle is really mucked up and you're in bed half the day, 
you can't connect with your friends, you can't learn, you can't get to school. And it also disrupts your natural melatonin drive, your natural cortisol drive. So really working on getting as normal a sleep-wake cycle as possible, having a good, healthy diet that's regular is important, and having a routine that supports you. So with some baseline activity um, and ticking all the boxes. So some activity, some rest, some connection with friends, ongoing connection with your education pathway and stress management. So all of those things are really important. So we've got to be quite holistic and look at all of them. And for some people, there might be a problem in one area more than the other that we can tweak. So the, the self-management course we have at Monash in terms of the content focuses very much on many of the things I've spoken about. So we have sleep hygiene and a stress management component. We have a graded activity component. And by graded activity, that's quite individualised because it depends on exactly where that young person is at and what their physical functioning was before chronic fatigue and now since they've been unwell and getting them support some support with grading that up in a safe way. Um, it's very goal orientated. So everyone's pathway is a little bit different. And we also have a cognitive behavior therapy component. And a lot of people with chronic fatigue, when you start talking about things like cognitive behavior therapy or psychological therapies, they say, well, this is not in my head. This is a real condition um, that's physical. And Cognitive behaviour therapy is in by no means saying that this is not a real physical condition. What it is supporting is that there are lots of stresses and cognitive processes that can make our symptoms worse and make the way we manage harder. So it's looking at breaking down some of those loops I was talking about, the stress loops, the worry of how am I going to cope with school today? How am I going to get through it? It's all going to be a disaster. I'm going to feel shit the whole day. And then you're completely exhausted before you're even in your school uniform. So it's working on some of those things. Um, and it also feeds into the stress management as well. And then we're really lucky that we also have school teachers that help in our program to help with that advocacy with school and looking at how can you grade up school if you've got a graded activity plan what might graded return to school look like so that's really really helpful what sorts of things can make the biggest difference again it's attention to all the little things because all the little things do add up you sleep your graded activity your routine a little bit of connection with friends um, helping identify what's important, what those goals are, but breaking those down. What are all the little steps so that each day you can focus on something that's still tangible and achievable and can head towards that bigger picture, that bigger goal. Staying connected with your education pathway because if you are getting to a bit of school, you're seeing your friends, you're still in the loop, you're doing some activity, incidental activity by being there and walking around. So it ticks a lot of boxes. So often looking at how a graded return to school is possible can be really helpful. And managing anxiety and stress, because as we said before, it is really exhausting. If you've got that flight fright response, then as I said, you've got those adrenal hormones pumping, it's chewing up energy. So practical strategies that you can use to help with that. Um, some of the strategies that I found really useful to teach young people, just very simple things like deep diaphragmatic breathing that they can use anywhere, anytime, be that if they're with their friends and things are getting too much, or if they're at home and they're worried about getting through their homework, just some tools that can then bring that anxiety level down. So learning those stress management techniques, modifying timetables to make things manageable, having a plan, having a set plan so it takes away the, oh, will I want to go? Will I want to do this? You've got a plan that you're going to try and stick to for the week with some flexibility. And that takes away that angst. And often accessing a psychologist who can help with practical stress management. So 
how have my vision and beliefs changed is one of the questions that Nathan asked me to think about. So I've been working with young people with chronic fatigue for over 10 years now. And I think my ideas have changed a lot since the start. At the start, I had this idea of, yep, you have this, this certain program and people go through a certain program and it was quite prescriptive. But I've really learned that there is not one size fits all. And ideally having flexibility there because everyone's journey is a bit different. So having an individualised approach linked to the young person's key values, that partnerships are really the key and not only partnerships with the young person you're working with and their family, but also that young person and us having a partnership with school, with sports coaches, so we can do some of that education, create understanding, and so we can work together. And the other thing that has been such a privilege and an honour is I've worked with so many amazing young people and families that are truly inspiring. Their dedication to just keep plugging on and working towards their goals in spite of really significant symptoms and challenges is very humbling and very inspiring. So I think that was my last slide. Okay, if you'd like to stop sharing your screen, we can go to a big picture. Okay. Um, and we can have a little bit of a chat, but that was um, fantastic. There's, I've actually been taking quite a few notes in there, Sabine, just to, there's some things that I really loved um, from what you've said, that partnership, I think in that advocacy is such a, a huge piece because um, I think young people sometimes and I think even adults as well we don't know what to say and whether it's the cognitive side of things and the mm. brain fog that comes with it or we don't necessarily know how to stand up to authority because we're we're used to being parented for example mm. and so to speak to a teacher and to communicate your needs is a real challenge mm. so Mm -hmm. Yeah, please talk. <laughs> yeah, I, I really agree. And I think that's one of the, uh, I think we, we put a lot of work into that advocacy and also advocacy through schools. Um, the other thing that is really important is that young people with chronic fatigue, chronic fatigue get access to special provisions. So we know that processing speed is slower. We've seen that on cognitive assessments of young people with chronic fatigue and on functional MRI. So mm -hmm. They need more time. They need more time to do exams. They need to be allowed to have rest breaks and stretch breaks. So for young people doing VCE exams, we do a lot of advocacy um, and formal letter writing around special provisions for exams so that they get those rest breaks, stretch breaks, extra time. Um, some young people say, oh, isn't that cheating? But it's not. It's, you, if, someone had, if someone has vision impairment, you and needs glasses, you don't ask them to do their exam without their glasses, it's a similar thing. So that's a really important piece of the work we do and we're very lucky that we've got some education consultants in our team that can help us with that link with school. Um, and I think advocacy sometimes also in the sporting area because some young people before becoming unwell, sport was their everything, it's very linked to their identity. So also being able to advocate that they still can stay connected with their sporting teams in a modified way. Yeah, and I'd agree that 100%. I often say, especially resuming life and getting back into it, this is an injury. You know, this is a medical condition. And mm -hmm. if I said someone hurt their ACL, so their knee, and that would take a year to rehab. And there would be a lot of steps. You've, the first thing is just to be able to move it, mm. you know, then to walk or to put weight through it, then to hop and then agility work. And I think often when we communicate with sports or teams that we, we talk about, this is a rehab program. Think of it just because you can't see the injury doesn't mean that it's not there. Mm. And to have a modified program. And sometimes that could just be turning up to training and having a chat. And, you know, that, again, that social connection is such an important thing. Mm, um, and we're getting a couple of questions coming okay. through, but I just want to, there's another one that I just want to ask. And a lot of parents that we see um, when we talk about devices and technology and using them and that social connection that can come from that. And is it good or is it bad? Mm. Um, we have a lot of debate and myself, I like to play some games. So I get along quite well with the adolescents that I manage. But what are your thoughts in regards to that use of technology and communication and games, et cetera? 
Yeah. I think like many things, there are positives and there are negatives and challenges. And I'll often have a discussion with the young person about what it, the fact that using screens is cognitively fatiguing. So we have to be careful about that and look at how long they're using it for. Are they having rest breaks and stretch breaks? Ideally, every 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and sometimes when, when young people are at home, there's not much else they feel they can do. Being on a screen is something that um, is easy, is engaging. It feels like it's relaxing, but it can actually be a lot more cognitively fatiguing than we realise. So just warning them about that and then looking at, well, what are the important things that you need to and want to do with the screen? You want to connect with your friends? So, okay, let's say that's sort of one of the top priorities. You want to do some gaming? Okay, that's another priority. Well, then maybe you do those two things and you limit the YouTubing and the other things on screens and looking at the amount of time. And what's really tricky is that if you look at sort of recommendations of what's a healthy amount of screen time, at one point the American College came out and said two hours a day uh, for young people. That's just really hard to achieve in this day and age when, you know, everything is online for school now. We've had homeschooling. We've got connecting with our peers, et cetera, through Facebook. But I'll have that conversation that, you know, there have been a, concerns that too much is not good for us. So sometimes it's a negotiation of, well, what are the things we can let go to give ourselves a bit more rest, um, cognitive rest, what are the things that are important to us that we want to keep? And that might be the connection with friends, that might be some gaming. Um, and try and see where we can pull back. Because um, certainly if we're on our screens all day long, and there are many young people I've worked with, that, you know, on the weekends, eight hours a day, easy. Um, because they're in bed, they've got their screen there, um, it bides the time. And then just le letting them understand the, the secondary consequences of that. The other thing that is really important with screens is where they're being used and how they're being used and what your posture is. Um, so we have lots of discussion around, you know, where are you sitting when you're using your screens? What's your posture like? Sometimes the headaches people are getting are because they're lying in bed like this on their screen and their neck um, is getting issues. So um, we have lots of discussion around healthy screen use. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I agree. I agree with everything you said there. I think there's such a complexity that goes with it and the individual and where they do it. And sometimes some people can read and it doesn't fatigue them and others that mm -hmm. they can't read at all. So there is such a huge scope. And I think if anything, that moves towards that individual advice um, rather than one size fits all. Yeah. And I think also around the sleep hygiene stuff, being, being really mindful that if you've got a blue screen up close, in those hours before bed, you're going to be mucking up your nighttime sleep. It's going to affect you deep wave sleep. So making sure that, you know, you, you, if you really do need to use a screen late at night, you're using a blue light filter. Um, it's watching TV because it's further away is actually better than having, you know, watching YouTube or watching a movie right up close with your screen. So discussions around that with sleep hygiene is really important as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Right, I've got, a, I've got a lot more things to discuss, but we'll go to some of the questions um, that uh, we've been asked. So, Caitlin um, asked. It was mentioned in regards to the physical or training feedback loop that exercise physiologists or physiotherapists can assist to prevent this negative loop from occurring. How exactly can an EP or physio assist in this situation? Mm -hmm. And and I think the key is having someone that's familiar with chronic fatigue and understands post-exertional malaise and how for people with chronic fatigue, exercise can make them worse. So exercise is one of these things, it's good and bad, too much and you're in bed, but not enough and you can't and you decondition. So having someone that can really understand that, look at what your baseline is and help you work out a program that's going to not make you worse, not make you feel worse, maintain your functioning is really important and it's complicated and it's individualized. So um, having a therapist that's familiar with that can be really helpful. Yeah, and I'd agree with that hundred percent. I think that too many people are told exercise is good for you. And it's like many different things, uh, it, 
it can be good for you, but also it can be bad for you as well. And it's very much has to be tailored towards the individual and exactly what you said, that it cannot make people feel worse. And it's also tailored to the goals of the individual. Um, so whether someone wants to get back to football or someone wants to get back to hanging out with their friends at the park, I think it's everything needs to be tailored individual, but it cannot lead to them feeling worse. Um, and it's not just about going out for a walk or exercising. It's, it's different levels and, and horses for courses. I think it's also very important not to point out that this is a ph physiological illness. We may not know the exact origins um, and what is causing this. Um, however, we do know that there are potential biomarkers. There's change in the mitochondria. There's change in the gut. There, there's a research out there that is quite promising. And like someone with diabetes, we don't expect that it's going to fix their diabetes, but we do know that it can help them manage their diabetes. So I think we need to look at it in a similar way with someone with chronic fatigue syndrome or ME, that it's not meant to be curative, like the psychology and what's being talked about as well. It doesn't mean that you're crazy. It's just that there are changes in life and we all can benefit from having that support physically and mentally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and I think um, what what's with the, the graded exercise studies um, and unfortunately why graded exercise perhaps has got a bad rap is because of that lack of understanding at times that things do have to be really individualised. And with looking at the studies that have been done that are done well and that are where you're using experts that are really rating things up specifically for the individual, the outcomes have been quite good. And um, I think it's, and I think the term graded exercise makes people think, well, I've got to go and run and I've got to go and be on a treadmill and it's about graded activity. So I think that point Nathan made of it's activity in general that we look at and grading up the activity you're doing, which will include the getting to school and walking around school and being at the park with your friends and you know, all those things. 100%. And to someone that is, say, mostly housebound, then sitting up can be exercise, a form of exercise. And I think we don't necessarily always look at that. Um, and I think if, if prescribed in the right way by someone who has experience with the conditions, then it's shown that it doesn't make people first worse, but it may not be a benefit for, benefit for everyone as well. There's other parts that may need to be managed or, or to work on. It's not meant to be a miracle cure. And the other thing also is that even if activity is not making people feel a lot better, we want to prevent the deconditioning that could make it harder for them to get better. So making sure that there's an understanding of that there's some baseline movement and activity still going um, is important too. And, and if, if some activity does make someone worse, having a health professional that can help them problem solve that and work out, well, why was that? And how could we tweak it? And how could we work it out so that it, you, know, you can still do what you want to do but not get worse can be really helpful. Yeah, definitely. And I think often when talking, like if you go to an accountant and say, do you do tax? They're going to say, yes, I, I do tax. Um, and if you go to a psychologist or do you help with anxiety or do you go to an exercise physiologist and say, do you do exercise? They're going to say yes. So I think it's really important um, that we interview the people that we're actually looking at getting help from and saying, well, what have you done before? Have you seen this before? Or what are your specialties? So that you make sure that they have some experience, but then also the personality meets the individual as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I see a lot of adolescent boys as part of my work because I was once an adolescent boy. Now I still see some adolescent females as well. Um, but then there's, we've got people on our team that are, were adolescent females and also had fatigue at those times. So they're often going to engage better. So I think it's not one, again, not one size fits all. Yeah. So I hope that helps, Caitlin. And if there's anything else or more questions you want to ask, then please type them in. Another, well. another sort of professional group to think about is there are some occupational therapists with mm. quite a lot of knowledge around chronic fatigue and timetabling and pacing and grading activity. So that can be another health professional resource, um, just getting a sense of, again, whether they've got experience because there is, as you say, a whole range of different OTs that do different types of OT work. So. Definitely. And in fact, that's actually Caitlin's next question. Which other allied health professionals or specialists would you refer to and yeah. when? Yeah. So if in the team that I have at Monash Children, as a team that work together, we have a clinical psychologist, we have an occupational therapist, we have an education consultant, we have a physiotherapist, 
Um, we also have a dietitian, and um, they're all involved in the group self-management program, but not everybody does that program. It might be that individuals might be referred to some of those team members for particular issues. So, for example, diet. So, for some people, their diet really becomes an issue for them because their sleep-wake cycle is disrupted, they feel nauseous, they're struggling to eat, they um, end up becoming iron deficient as a consequence, um, or they're sort of eating unusual things at unusual times because they're getting cravings for sugar or salt. Um, so their diet can be a real mess. So getting a dietitian to help them work through that and get back to regular healthy eating can be really important. Some people have a lot of gut symptoms, a lot of irritable bowel symptoms. So having a dietitian help them work through, well, maybe you know, a diet that's, that's lower in some of the things we know can contribute to irritable bowel. Some, I don't know whether you've heard of FODMAPs, those sorts of foods with um, sort of undigestible sugars. Maybe that might help with those irritable bowel symptoms. And we know that weight is unlikely to cure chronic fatigue, but it's likely to make you feel better if your tummy's feeling better. So a dietitian can be useful in those settings. Um, an occupational therapist can be quite helpful from the point of view of, um, so some people think, well, what do occupational therapists do? They're about your occupation, which is what you do day in, day out. So not just work, but like school and how you look after yourself and how you care for yourself. So they can have some really great ideas about how to make showering easier, how you can save energy when you're showering, when you're dressing yourself. So for people that are really quite unwell and struggling, they can be very helpful to look at, is there equipment that can help me? Um, how can I do these processes to save energy so I've got some energy for other things? And they can also be quite helpful with timetabling as well um, and going through and timetabling your day. Um, so occupational therapists are quite helpful in, in that respect. Physiotherapists, exercise physiologists, some of them often will also do some timetabling and grading of your activity level um, and uh, looking at your physical functioning and, and preventing deconditioning. Um, psychologists can be really helpful in a number of ways. So anxiety management, stress management is a really big one and some practical tools around that can be really universally helpful for any chronic illness and particularly an illness that's getting in the way of you being able to do the things you want to and need to do. Sometimes those frustrations lead to depression, lead to lowered mood. So a psychologist can be really helpful at looking at that as well. Um, and sometimes it's something really specific. So it might be that there is a lot of anxiety and stress around sleep. And sleep onset insomnia is something that I've seen a lot of young people struggle with. They feel exhausted. They really want to sleep. They're lying there in bed. They just can't sleep. They're tossing and turning. And the more they want to sleep, the less they can sleep. So a psychologist can help work through that sleep onset insomnia and the stress around sleep in quite a specific way. Um, so I've covered OT, physio, psychologist, education, education consultants, so teachers. Um, so I'm very lucky in the, in the clinic I work in, um, the teacher gets to meet the young person quite early um, and will get access to them, even if they're not going through the self-management program. And the teacher will do a lot of checking in around how are things going at school? Does the school understand? Are they modifying your program adequately? And if not, the teacher can do some, some ring up and some advocacy for the family. Um, the sorts of people that can help you in the community around that, usually all schools have either um, a school counsellor or a school guidance officer um, that ideally should meet that role. But sometimes it's about finding a teacher at your school that gets it, that has maybe experienced someone with chronic fatigue, has themselves had chronic fatigue, and tapping into that person and using them to help you. So it can vary a bit from school to school as to who that person is, but all schools do have counsellors and guidance officers that should be able to be a first port of call. That's fantastic. And 
for yourself or one of the other in part of that question is, so when would you refer on to another specialist? Because I suppose a lot of people have seen a lot of doctors and, and getting mm -hmm. towards you and you've gone, yes, this fits and you've excluded the other conditions, but when would you refer on or is it appropriate to refer on? Yeah. So if I think I'm worried I'm missing something, I might refer on. Um, if, if I'm thinking this doesn't, doesn't fit with classic chronic fatigue, could there be obstructive sleep apnea? Could there be narcolepsy? Is there something else going on? I might refer to a sleep physician for some help around that. If there are very significant POT symptoms, postural orthostatic tachycardia symptoms, then I might refer to a POT specialist for some help with that. Um, and there are some cardiologists and neurologists with a special interest. So um, I might get some, you know, if the standard POTS measures aren't making a big difference and I'm concerned that we might need some specialist input there, then I might refer to them. Um, if there are a lot of gut symptoms and I'm worried, am I missing something gut related? Then I might refer to a gastroenterologist to just make sure that there isn't something else along those lines. And then probably lastly, the rheumatologist I would sometimes refer to when I think, well, could this be, you know, are there some blood markers that make me worry about an immunological condition and I'll get them to have another look. But usually there's been something that's a bit out of the ordinary if I'm referring to another specialist that makes me think, is this perhaps not classic chronic fatigue? Could it be one of the mimickers? And just making sure that we're covering that. The other thing that I might also uh, think of other specialists for or try and manage myself is that there can be other symptoms and conditions that do make your symptoms worse. So sinusitis is a big one. Sinusitis can uh, and hay fever can really make people feel a lot worse. For girls, periods can be a real nuisance. Some people just, their chronic fatigue symptoms are so much worse the week they have their period that getting some, doing some menstrual management can really make a big difference for them. Um, and certainly if you're iron deficient, that's going to be making you feel pretty rubbish. So making sure that um, we've got good nutrition going and that we correct iron deficiency. So those would sort of be the situations in, a, in which I might pull another specialist or really help from the GP. GPs are great at managing a lot of those conditions like hay fever, sinusitis, period issues. So making sure we've got the GP on board to regularly help and support as well. 100% and I think adding to that as well, if you're unsure of any symptoms, if something you're going, oh, I wonder if it's related, then the best thing is actually to put it out there because it may not be, but it also may be one of those missing pieces where we go, actually, that's very important. Yep. And no question's a silly question. Exactly. Exactly right. And to that point, if there are any more questions because we've gone through most of them, then please pop them in. Um, and I'm just going to put in there, with orthostatic intolerance or, or POTS, what do you see the prevalence in your population anecdotally so come into your clinic? I haven't done sort of strict figures. Most would have some symptoms of dizziness. Um, most would mention that that's been an issue at some point, that they, they've got some postural dizziness. Of those that actually have the blood, when, when then I check for blood pressure changes or pulse rate changes, it might be more half to a third that do have, or probably more a third that have significant blood pressure or pulse rate changes rather than half, I think more a third. Um, so lots of symptoms, but those with a really specific rise in pulse rate, drop in blood pressure when I'm checking posturally, yet more like a third. Does that sound similar to your, your group? Yeah, exactly. We um, did a study into orthostatic intolerance and ex orthostatic intolerance or POTS and, and exercise tolerance a couple of years ago, and it worked out to be about 35 to 40%. Um, mm -hmm. of our, our patient load, but they're not just adolescents, there's also adults within that yep. as well. Um, and we do know that for us in the adolescent population, it's usually about 80% female and 20% male. Uh, as I would well. say, yeah, more would be female. And Caitlin said, great, thank you very much for the detailed response in regards to that question, which is great as well. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I think one of the one of the areas I think is the most challenging and being a parent myself and having some children that have occasional health issues is that you only want the best for them. Mm. Um, and that concern and worry and, and what to do uh, in those times, it can be a real challenge. Um, and one of the, I suppose one of the stories I like to tell um, 
is re when we say, how are you? Because I think with fatigue and, and as people have experienced or know, it doesn't go. Mm. There's always a level of crap um, each day. Mm -hmm. um, so is there any advice that you would give parents in sort of the management of that or, or mm. how to support their, their child or adolescent? Um, I think this is something I've learned in, in, in talking in, in, and changed in the way I talk to young people. Early on, I used to do a lot of asking about how is your pain? How is your fatigue? Let's measure the pain. Let's measure the fatigue. And I've moved really away from that because fatigue and pain are there a lot. And I've moved more towards asking about how's school going? How are you going with that particular goal you're interested in? Um, how are you going with with your friends rather than the than that how are you feeling in yourself inside yourself because um i have had times where there's a real dis there can be a real disconnect between those two and i think the focus on the little steps towards the goals and the positive aspect of that is much more important than the how are you, how's your pain? So, and um, and it's really challenging for parents because they're trying to get a gauge of, okay, what's our day going to be like today? What's it going to look like? You know, where are we at today? Um, so I think that's where the, the having the plan comes in well to say, okay, this is our plan for the week. We're going to have a really good go at sticking to this plan no matter how we feel. And that takes away the, how are you feeling today? Will we or won't we? It's like, okay, um, what can I do to help you get ready today? Um, and just moving through that planned process can really take away that push-pull and that, how are we going? What are we going to do? Are we going to manage? Um, yeah, I agree. I think, how can I help you? is a great yeah. um, thing to say to people because they can say, I'm fine. Mm. Or actually, can you please do this or that? Um, I think also one of the things that in Australia, um, I often tell the story when I moved to the UK because they go, you all right? And in Australia, yeah. we say, how are you going? And that yeah. basically means hello. <laughs> yeah. And so we don't always have to say I'm good or I'm bad. And I actually encourage people not to say I'm good. Yeah. You know, it's say, okay, one step at a time, getting there. Yep. Um, and I think us as, well, as practitioners and as, as parents need to sort of be aware of that. And I think it's, it's good to care, but to keep it in a contained way mm. um, yep. as well. And I've had some young people that have had negative experience with psychologists um, because it's been a real focus on how you're feeling about your chronic fatigue and how you're feeling and how are you managing. And they've actually wanted to focus on, what they're doing and how they're progressing. So, you know, I've had that conversation with them that you, you can say to your psychologist, I don't want to talk about that today. I want to focus on a stress management technique or how I can settle down before sleep. Um, you know, that, that that might be something you need at the moment rather than talking about how you're feeling and that's okay too. Yeah, 100%. And I think it's also coming, I think it's openly having that conversation. Um, but then also, you know, every person is different in how they're going to respond. And we try as much as we can within our sessions, we start, we start with four questions. What are you grateful for? What have you done well? And what are your wins? You know, what are you struggling with at the moment? And how can I help you today? Yep, that's, that's so good. That's so good. And, um, you know, and you're right, some people when they see the psychologist might want to be talking about how they're feeling and they're frustrated and they're feeling shitty about their chronic fatigue. And that's really important and right for them. But some people might want something else and just, it's okay to ask and say, this is what I need. This is what I need help with. Yeah. One of the things, one of the things we do in our CBT um, part of our program is assertive communication because that's really hard when, as you say, you've been, you've, you've been unwell, uh, you haven't been able to advocate for yourself so much. So learning some assertive communication around that can be really helpful. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's a great conversation. There's a lot of takeaways there for um, 
for, for adolescents and, and parents as well. Um, I've got a bit of a curly one for you. Oh, um, no! I know. Because <laughs> this is one thing that I, I, I've, I manage with some adolescents, and I think it, it is a little bit individual, but what's more important, social or school? Yeah. So I sort of talk about you've got to tick all the developmental boxes. So you need a bit of it all. And... Um, because, so I often talk about how, you know, the, the role of adolescence and, and the things that you're trying to learn and you're trying to learn about socialisation and being a social individual and connecting with your peers. So that is really important. But you also need to have an education pathway so you can get where you want to go in life. So you need a bit of it all and you can't sort of completely exclude one. You have to tick all those boxes. So it's often about a balance and saying, well, um, I need a bit of this, but I also need a bit of this. Mm. And, and sometimes school is good because it can tick both the boxes of socialization and education, but not always, not for everyone. For some people, school is so overwhelming and exhausting. They can't even think about socializing there. Um, so how can we modify it? And school can look really different and, for lots of different people, we have people who might do a combination of um, some on-site school, some virtual school, people who do virtual school and get socialisation in another way. Um, it can be a real mix. Yeah, it can be. And there is not an answer for that question, but it's really great to hear. Um, yeah, the, it's, it's taking each individual into account. Yeah. With that as well, I mean... I think when I when I deal with an adult, I'm dealing with the adult. Now, occasionally you have partners and things like that, but for the most part, you're dealing with that one individual. Mm -hmm. But dealing with adolescents or children, you're not just dealing with the adolescents, you're, you're dealing with the family. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you need to put a lot of work into the adolescent, but sometimes you need to put a bit of work into the family as well. How do you go about that? Yeah. So in our self-management program, it is very much focused on the young person, but we have... A, a session that's with the parents as well and then a couple of parent morning teas where the parents can go off and kind of debrief um, so that's we had feedback that that's really helpful and then when I see yeah adolescents as a routine I'll spend some time with them all together then some time with just the adolescent by themselves and then bring the family parents back in so um and often it's about hearing what's going on for the parents as well as the adolescent and meeting in the middle. And um, adolescents will have very valued opinions and, and points and thoughts about what's going on, which may be quite different to their parents, but their parents' thoughts and opinions are really valuable and important too. And kind of helping them meet in the middle um, can be really important. Sometimes, um, looking at things like contracts has been useful. So, um, you know, a contract around, okay, my parent can't nag me unless it's, you know, two hours past a certain time or unless I haven't done these particular processes or exercises that, you know, are going to be important to help me get well or be well. Um, not a very, a very, not a very, a vague example, but you know, some sort of contract like that. So the parent knows, okay, I, I'm, I'm not going to hassle her a hundred times a day. I'm going to wait and see and give her a chance. Um, so that can sometimes be helpful. Um, and yeah, just helping with that negotiation and that understanding. Mm. Um, and it has impact on siblings as well. And I think mm. that's something that's sort of important to keep in mind as well. You know, um, siblings can get frustrated because they can see that the, the young person with chronic fatigue can't be as involved in house chores or is getting more attention or so um, talking, being open about that and talking about potential strategies. Yeah, yeah definitely. And I think the last point you said there is one of the most important, just being open mm. that everyone's in it together. Yeah. Um, you yeah. Know, no one's wanting someone to be unwell. No one chooses to have these conditions. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, having that open and honest conversations is, is so important. Yep. Excellent. Yep. I could talk all day about this, Sabine. Um, <laughs> I really could. I, I really enjoy the time and your expertise <laughs> and, and everything you've talked about today. It's 
to me, it's been exceptionally uh, valuable and um, if I'm sure that everyone would like to say a thank you and they can type that in. Um, but really do appreciate your time. The hour has gone exceptionally quickly. Um, but if there's any follow-up questions or anything that anyone else would like to ask or did not want to ask today, then please just send through those questions and we'll endeavour to get on top of them. Um, maybe if we have enough, we might have a Q&A session um, down the track or something like that Sounds as well. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so again, thank you very much. Um, and this, we we'll sort of finish up with one of the, the quotes I think that you, you said today. And I think this one's actually a really great one. And I think the aims of what we're doing with the people that we help manage and, and move forward to basically that the illness or the fatigue doesn't get in the way of life. And I think that's a wonderful goal and everything we should be aiming to do. So again, thank you very much, Sabine, for speaking today. No worries. Thanks for having me. See ya. Okay, bye.